Hello everyone and welcome to the next video in our model selection series. This one is going to be about sparsity and in particular how to use the L1 norm to enforce sparsity. And so let's consider a little bit what, what we even mean by the L1 norm and why this is a useful tool for sparsity. So in the end we hopefully can draw a nice little figure here that shows us why this is useful from a you know, graphical perspective. But let's go through this step by step, okay? What have we done until now when we talked about regularization, okay? What this means is you have a loss function, you minimize L, which is often the, the mean squared error, and then you add a term with a regularization parameter. So the loss function plus lambda times, and what we have done until now was adding the two norm, okay? So the, the sum of the squared entries of your weight matrix, right? So the two norm is, or the P norm is always sum of the entries raised to the pth power and then taking the pth square root. So square root of norm, uh, the individual element squared, which is the, the, the standard vector length as we're used to it. Um, but now, well, what was the reason behind this? So the idea would be if we restrict the weights to smaller values, this will give us, uh, if you think about polynomials for instance, um, smaller changes um, when we, you know, slightly vary the inputs, okay? Small weights means small slopes in terms of how the input is, is changed. Um, so I'm going to use the word smoother, which is mathematically not correct, but what it means is um, you have lesser variations, so you have less strong oscillations, you have a much nicer, smoother behavior, so not smooth in the mathematical sense, um, model H. And so the smoothness often leads to better generalization. For this reason, we often use the two norm as a regularization parameter. It all has very nice um, properties because it is differentiable very, very easily. Right? This is very favorable for optimization. But now let's ask the question, what if we want to have certain additional properties? So maybe we have a large number of weights and we want as few as possible of them to be active, okay? So the question is now, what if we want W to be sparse? Oh, let's just use this in, in pink, sparse. What this means is we want as few non-zero entries as possible. This has two favorable properties. For one, it also will lead to better generalization because we have fewer terms. And second of all, maybe we even get a very good approach to interpretability. Right? Maybe in the end we will find that our model consists of a few important terms only and these are then interpretable. If you have a linear model, and use linear regression plus this sparsity enforcing regularization, which we will see now, then you have few parameters and you can very nicely pinpoint the meaning of particular entries of your regression vector to, to the output, okay? So this is very, very helpful. So what can we do? The most, um, well, it's an accurate technique would be to use the, what we call zero pseudonorm. So what this means is if we take the, the zero norm, we just count the number of non-zero entries, right? So this is all the indices for which the corresponding entry is not zero and then we just measure the size of the set. So mathematically looks a bit nasty. It just means go through all the WI and, oh, sorry, there's a zero missing. And whenever you have a non-zero entry, you add one to this norm. And so it's not a norm because if I multiply this with alpha, it would give me the same expression. So it violates the, the, the rules for, for a norm. But well, certainly it looks a little bit like this. Um, it's um, equal to zero only if w is zero and it's non-negative, but still not everything is satisfied. 
And this also leads to a huge problem in terms of optimization, right? So this is very nasty for optimization because you can basically do nothing about this. Uh, let's assume your one weight was zero. And then you turn on one weight and set it to 10 to the minus 12 or some other very small number. Then the norm jumps by one, okay? So it's not even continuous. And this makes it very, very nasty for optimization. And you just end up with a combinatorial problem. So the question that we need to ask is, can we do something in between? Okay, and so here's zero, here's two, let's take one. <laughs> but the meaning is not to, you know, go in between, but we will see precisely why the one norm is, is a good idea. Okay, so the compromise that we're going to take is the L1 norm. And this is, you know, if we follow the definition of P norms, this is just... summing up the absolute values of the individual entries, right? So it's just like this. So you raise everything to the power of one and then take the one th square root. So the p norm with one, it just gives you, you sum up the entries one till till q. Okay. So why does this help us? Um, we, will, we, we will see, well, first of all, it is a regularization parameter in the same sense as this one, you know, reducing the weights will give you a reduced norm. So it helps you reducing the weights, but hopefully it will also help us to make this a little sparser. Now, but before we go there, let's consider one issue and then see the advantage. And then this will lead us to the motivation for, for the next video, okay? So the resulting problem now is minimize the Ws from RQ. And then we have some loss functions for the mean squared error maybe, plus a regularization coefficient times the one norm. And this is what we call um, L1 regularization due to this. Right, exactly to this, you add a L1 term. Um, this looks actually not so problematic if you think about this, right? We have replaced the, the two by one. But let's think about this in a bit more detail, okay? Let's think about the one dimensional case, okay? So Q is one. This is your weight. And this is the absolute value of this weight. And so what you will see is that for positive weights, this is just the identity function, right? W and W absolute value are the same. For negative values, you negate the sign, okay? So you get this function. And now you see the problem in this point here. You cannot define a derivative, right? For here, the, the derivative is minus one. Here it's plus one. Here, there's no differentiability. Well, we need to address this. Um, so this is a problem. On the other hand, we will see that it has um, properties that will help us. Okay, so for, before we go here, let's consider the second example. Now, if we have two parameters, and I'm going to draw now the line where the norm is exactly one. Okay, so if one weight is one, this is norm would be one. Same here, right? If the second weight is one, one, the first one is zero, this gives you one. And the same holds true for this one. And the same holds true for this one, right? And if you have 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, this will also give you a sum of one, okay? And so if you think about this a little longer, you will find that the level set where this one is one is actually a square rotated by 45 degrees. And so this is actually why sparsity will be um, enforced by this, okay? Um, and to see this, let's take a look at this picture. And let's assume this was our, uh, we train a linear model. So this is 
you know, sort of a set of ellipses. These are level sets of our loss function. This is our L of W. And at each of these curves, we have a constant value, right? So these are supposed to be ellipses, and so you would find this minimum. But now you add a regularization term that tells you, okay, give me this minimum, but also minimize the one norm or minimize the two norm, okay? So let's consider this uh, with the two norm first, okay? So let's say here's the, let's just assume this was one, okay? So minimize the two norm means, um, right, you, let's draw a, a level set where the two norm is constant. And so this is a poor attempt at a circle, but you see at the squared norm, you see the, the level set of where it's one is actually a circle with radius one. Okay, and now let's consider the one norm of length one. Okay, so in terms of a regularization term, so loss function plus lambda times this term, if you add the one norm or at the two norm with level set one, you get the same value if you think about this, right? And now this loss function looks like this. Exactly as we have drawn it here. Okay, and now you see something. The smallest loss function value with this norm is actually this point. Okay, so wherever else we have the same norm value, we are further away from this minimum, okay? So clearly this is the, for this norm one, um, the one norm being one, this is the smallest loss function value. And it coincides with one axis, which means the w1 would be zero in this case. Whereas if we minimize the two norm um, as a constraint or regularization parameter, we would get a point like this, okay? So you see, this one is closer to the minimum, and so this one has a one, a two norm, and so clearly this term plus a smaller loss would be advantageous. And so you see, this is why sparsity is enforced, pictorially, right? This, this peaky shape of the one norm will ensure that in many, many cases, not all of them, you can construct situations where, where this is not helping, but you will find in many situations that this actually helps us to enforce sparsity. Okay, so this is why we use L1 regularization. One thing that we need to discuss is the question, how to take derivatives, okay? How do we take the derivative of the one norm? Right, because clearly here we run into problems and so optimization becomes a little harder. But this is what we're going to discuss uh, in the next video. So thanks for now and see you then.